Good afternoon. We're going to talk about what I would say first and arguably is the most important of the six capitals in the postmodern economy. That is intellectual capital. Traditionally, these are knowledge-based intangibles that include intellectual property such as patents, trademarks, trade dress, trade secrets, business method patents, proprietary processes, copyrights, software development, and distribution licenses, as well as intellectual mind sharing within the corporate enterprise. According to the IARC, the Integrated International Reporting Council, the carrier or the owners of this intellectual property is actually the organization itself. My perspective, however, is that intellectual property is actually a bit dated in old world thinking. It's a, it's a concept that may be included in the IARC, but it's, it's, it's an EU and rest of world based concept. I would actually label this capital as reputational capital, especially in the States, because I believe brand identity, knowledge of the market and customer, ability of the company to distribute around the world, consumer intimacy, and brand reputation are much more instrumental in market acceptance and sales growth and value creation than the intrinsic value of an entity's intellectual property. I'm going to give you a personal example. When I had management oversight of the IFI patent claims database at Walters Kluwer, and this is actually the database that the patent, U.S. Patent Office uses in D.C. to make sure their classifications are correct, I visited my patent contributors at Procter & Gamble's in Cincinnati. These are the engineers and the intellectual property attorneys, and they have huge numbers of patents in their storage. In fact, they're probably second only to the defense industry in the number of patents that they have in America. But what's tremendously interesting is when I met with the marketing folks, they said that they would not even bother introducing any of their patents to the consumer market if it could not generate in excess of $50 million in revenue. So it is not the intellectual property of the entity that really matters. It's how the intellectual property is deployed. And that's why I say the focus should be on brand, image, and, and reputation. The question is whether marketplace acceptance is a function of intellectual property or really the reputation and brand of the owner. It's really how this intellectual property is deployed. And it is dependent, as you will see, on brand identity and reputation. And even in the internet world, the barriers to entry still remain the ability to sell and market your goods or your services. And more today than ever, they depend on the brand and reputation and sometimes the intelligent mining of patent claims of other enterprises. Let's, let's give this uh, example a, a little more depth. I wanted to share with you an actual case study on the failure of a risk manager or corporate legal advisor to properly manage their intellectual property, that is, their patent database, or to think creatively or sometimes outside of the box to provide some integrated thinking in their review of the inventory of patents and claims of what this product should be used for, that is, the patent claim. As you know, uh, and this is an actual case study, uh, as you know, Xerox owns the patent or owned the patent and the technology for xerography, which historically has used positively charged carbon particles to assemble into lines or images, and that's really the basis behind the photocopier. Well, my colleagues at Procter & Gamble realized that they could develop a $100 million business from this simple technology, which Xerox had absolutely no clue about. So they patented a microencapsulated, positively charged carbon ion to attract dirt, and that became the billion-dollar Swiffer industry. Had Xerox tried it, they would not have had the reputation, brand, brand marketing, brand identity, or distribution ability for this process to succeed. So that's why I prefer to use the term reputational capital over intellectual capital. However, Jane Gleason White in her book Six Capitals provides some history into the growth and value of intellectual property and how it has lost its connection to stock price and value. 
We're going to look at three cases at Apple, Chipotle Grill, and Wells Fargo shortly. But just from a historical perspective, Jane mentioned that Tomo, a Chicago-based intellectual assets financial services provider, published a study on the rapid increase in intangible assets in U.S. businesses since 1975. Its analysis was based on market value of the Standard & Poor's 500 companies. Ocean Tomo research showed that since the 1990s, the market value of these companies has increasingly diverged from their book assets, their book values, which is their book value, which is simply assets less its liabilities. In 1975, a company's balance sheet showed about 83% of its value with only 17% of intangibles. Reflecting the fact that the value of the enterprise was deeply rooted in its tangible assets, manufactured in financial assets. And just think of the old Ford trucks coming off the assembly line and the huge parking lots waiting where the big Ford trucks are waiting to be loaded onto trailers and shipped to dealers and consumers. And that's when you think of inventory and tangible assets. In 19, diary forward to 2009, and according to White, intangible value spiked to 81% of the S&P 500 market value. That meant that only 19% of the value of the Standard & Poor's 500 could be accounted for on the balance sheet of the enterprise's financials. White tells how in 2012, for example, AOL sold 800 patents to Microsoft for $1.1 billion. But this is not shown in any financial reports, and it never appeared on the assets of AOL Time Warner. Two economists reported by Jane Gleason White, Hassett, and Shapiro estimated that the intellectual property of U.S. companies 10 years ago, that was, was worth 5 to $5.5 trillion dollars which is, which is, as you know, larger than the gross domestic product of most countries. So as stewards of the enterprise, as fiduciaries, you're going to have to make an inventory of the intangible assets that create value for your companies. You've got to learn how to identify them, how to measure them, how to monitor them, and how to report on them. Otherwise, you're losing the value creation of the entity of the company that you serve. Now, we're, we're going to uh, cover some of the human capital and supply chain issues later. I wanted to bring up these three examples of the disconnect between financial and manufactured capital, which we'll discuss later, and reputational capital, which we're going to, of course, we're talking about now. Let's agree that behind reputational capital lies some intellectual capital, but at least in one case, as we're going to say, there is not a one-to-one -one connection between them. I want to introduce you to the financial and non-financial perspectives of Chipotle Grill, Apple, and Wells Fargo. So let's take a look at Apple first. You have the handouts of their balance sheet, their income statement, and their historical market cap, which is basically the total value of their shares traded on the exchanges. In this case, it's the NASDAQ, one of three principal exchanges in the States. The stock was trading in the 110 dollar range around December 2016. But if you look at the balance sheet and income statement versus its market cap, let's take a look at historically, say February 2015. Its market cap, about six months later, was over three quarters of a trillion dollars. Now comparable market caps for Cisco were about a sixth of that, or for Intel, these are chip manufacturers, was about the same or uh, Qualcomm, which manufactures phone components, was about eighth the market cap. So if we look at the balance sheet financials even six months later, <coughs> and if we look at the category called current assets, well, Apple has some cash, they have some CDs, they have some cash equivalents, they have some short-term investments, maybe some short-term corporate paper to get some higher interest rates on, on the cash that they have. But what is remarkable, what is remarkable is they have absolutely practically no inventory. In traditional businesses like autos or airplanes, 
inventory was the driver of future sales. But here you can see they only have $2 billion of inventory. And if we move down to their income statement, they generated $93 billion on $2 billion of, of inventory. They, they generated $93 billion on $2 billion of inventory. So if you'll notice, their level of inventory also has not changed over the last couple of years. And on their bottom line, their net income of $53 billion is huge, which means they would have to, on this basis, turn their inventory over 25 times in, more, in one year just to generate their $53 billion. So obviously, the value of this stock is totally independent of anything that appears on the balance sheet or income statement. Or to put it another way, something else is going on here that the financial wizards are totally missing. If you go one step further, in addition, the value of their stock is worth over 12 years of future sales. And the reason I bring this up is because the reputational capital of Apple is awesome. It's incredible. But it's critical to their long-term viability and future sustainability. And they're the best in their sector. Especially as long as there are aggressive, aggressive, strong, and serious competitors to their smartphones, computers, software, iPads, and ebook readers, their reputational capital is essential to their future value creation and the future value of their business. They are absolutely the darling of the millennials. But what would happen if their reputation was impaired? Their competitors, as I mentioned, arguably have serious competitive offerings in every space that Apple lives in. So I refer you to the I refer you to the article of August 22nd 2016 in Forbes magazine. And there are similar articles about cocoa harvesting and human rights violations by, by chocolate and cocoa companies Nestle and Hershey. What would occur if the public consciousness continued to be raised by headlines such as latest Foxconn worker deaths build case for Apple to move operations from China? What would happen if sustainability organizations, human rights organizations, social media discussions on Facebook, Twitter, and others started filtering down to discussions by the millennial class that uses 24-hour Apple stores as replacement for bars and student hangouts throughout the world? This news report comes from the Wall Street Journal and from Forbes magazine. These are not this is conservative business press. This is not traditional social liberal media. So let's say you worked at Apple. You were a corporate steward, a fiduciary. You worked in legal compliance or risk management. Or you were an outside advisor, an accountant, a, a CPA, an attorney, a financial analyst. Or someone who was consulting for Apple. Would you say anything? What would you do? Could you argue, or would you argue, would you raise the issue that there might be considerable value destruction if the mainstream consumer, the millennial, became offended by your behavior? Or would you, would you suggest exploring alternatives? Would you suggest putting a corporate spin on it? Would you deny it? What would you do to protect and preserve a stellar reputation and enhance the value creation of your enterprise over a long-term period. Now let's look secondly at Chipotle Grill. This is a company which, as I mentioned, lost half its value, $11 billion, over a three-day period. And nobody said it better than the Oracle of Omaha, Warren Buffett. According to Buffett, it takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to ruin it. If you think about that, you'll do things differently. Well, obviously, Chipotle Grill has not come out of what I call their taco tragedy, their burrito breakdown, their mojito meltdown. Their comparable sales continue to drop month to month, 11th consecutive decline in sales. In fact, 
the articles say that people are actually scared to go into these stores and they're giving away free burritos. The question is whether free burritos make customers forget about their health uh, scares. And for the first time in 10 year history, the company actually lost money this quarter. So the question I ask you, if you were the steward, a fiduciary in the corporate advisory inner circle, or as an outside advisor, what would you do? What would you say to the CEO or the board? What would you suggest as a strategy to build back the reputational capital of a company that performed spectacularly for the past 10 years? Again, this is not the intellectual property of the company. This is the reputational capital, the brand identity of the company. Now, what if it was that you worked there for a number of years, you invested in the company, you were an analyst, a financial advisor, or perhaps your pension had significant stock in, in Chipotle Group. What would you do as a steward of this enterprise? And let's take a look at the third, the third case in terms of reputational capital, Wells Fargo. Well, there's nothing safer than watching a Wells Fargo stagecoach go by with the security and the safety of holding people's money. And I'm sure you've seen the new ads for Wells Fargo. We want to restore our trust in you. So put your stewardship hat on. Put your fiduciary hats on. What if you received a letter from the United States Senate, which, which you have in front of you, from Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, and others, and a letter went to you, as well as other cor corporate fiduciaries and stewards and outside advisors? Well, what would you do? Would you deny this? Would you accept the issue and apologize, say it'll never happen again? Would you risk significant legal liability? Three, would you diminish it? Oh, not that important. We have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of employees. We only fired 5,300, and it was for bad business practices. But let's put a spin on it. Four, would you point the fingers to others and say, those that did these bad deeds were fired, and they're no longer with us? Or would you resign and find a better company to work for? Or would you try a different spin and say, oh, insignificant, and it only happened in one office, and, and, and we got rid of all those, those people that did these bad deeds? Or seven, would you get behind it and show the public how you've changed and reorganized? And would you look to, at the board and at the CEO and ensure there's a turnover so that there's, there's new thinking, there's critical thinking, there's integrated thinking, responsible thinking uh, in, in protection of society and, and the general public you serve. In the case of Wells Fargo, as you know, the board of directors, as well as the CEO, were under the same financial incentive program. The board said it was shocked by this, but in truth, my perspective is they blessed it as did the two major mutual fund holders, Fidelity and uh, Vanguard, which I had mentioned, voted in favor of the stock option incentive compensation plan for both the board and the CEO. The point is that Wells Fargo dismissed and probably ruined some of the financial lives of 5,300 employees over a five-year period. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau investigation concluded that Wells Fargo engaged in fraudulent conduct in a mass scale, on a mass scale. What would you do? How would you behave? What ethical basis would you use to support it? And what would you risk as a result? So this concludes our session on the first capital, reputational or intellectual capital. Thank you.